All right. Our next talk is what I learned from um, AI as a creative adversary. Um, our speaker is Steph May Swanson. Uh, she's a writer and an artist and um, wrote a story about an AI-generated character and recently had a, um, a video installation, I would say, called uh, Suicide Free at the DEF CON conference in Vegas. Um, please welcome her with a huge round of applause. Hi. Uh, yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, my name is Steph, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today, tonight. It's 11 o'clock on a Thursday night. I'm going to talk to you about how I summoned a demon. Um, and weave that into other themes about how we relate to uh, AI tools in art making or how at least I do, and I hope to encourage other people to as well. Um, before we get into the demon stuff, um, I need to explain for people who aren't completely initiated, uh, initiated uh, how negative prompt weights work. And to explain those, I need to explain how prompt weights work. Prompt weights are basically a a syntax that breaks up a text prompt into a text image AI um, where you can assign chunks of the prompt a numerical value that basically says how important different parts of the prompt are. Um, so if you want to make a picture of a blue dog with white fluffy clouds and, you know, for some reason the dog isn't blue enough, then you can break off that like as a chunk, the blue, and assign it a numerical value that's higher than one to tell uh, uh, the AI next time to give more weight to the, the part that makes it blue. Um, a side effect of the system is that you can assign negative values to words and phrases, uh, which basically means to make something the most dissimilar uh, from that token or chunk um, instead of trying to make something the most similar to it. And I was just playing around one day, and I've done stuff with negative prompt weights before. Um, you know, in a year before I made Loeb. But one day I was just playing around and making pictures of Marlon Brando. I don't know, don't ask. And I decided to assign a negative prompt weight to it. Uh, you know, what is the farthest thing away in this model's latent space from Marlon Brando? And so I did Brando minus one. And I got this strange logo, uh, Digita Pintix, with like a skyline on it. And in previous experiments, I had kind of done this kind of chain of opposites game, just because I think it's fun to do, but it also helps you explore kind of unexpected new areas of the latent space. So the next thing I did was I put Digit Pintic Skyline logo and used a negative prompt weight there on the whole thing. And the result was this woman who has this very haunting expression, looks really sad, has these red cheeks, and she sometimes has like a teddy bear or children with her, and she always showed up for this prompt, uh, which is, was not usual behavior for this model. Um, over and over again, sometimes surrounded by children or like smaller people that don't look like children. Um, one of the images even ha was like an album art, and this is where she got her name, Loeb, because it looks like her name is Loeb up in the corner. Um, and so I immediately stopped doing the chain of opposites game because I had found something way more interesting by accident, uh, which was this like persistent emergent character that doesn't exist in real life. Um, and so fast forward and I have like 900 pictures of Loeb. 
And my friend says, you summoned a demon, you know that, right? <laughs> then I started combining images of Loeb, putting those images back in as prompts. I also started combining it with other artworks that I had made previously that I had liked. And something even weirder happened. First of all, Loeb persisted in like the child generations of combining her with other things, like extremely clearly, like if she was a celebrity that you would think that would be recognized and taken up by this, you know, whatever, however this system is parsing the tokens or like turning the images into vectors, uh, it wouldn't like persistently recreate the same character or at least what I perceive to be the same character in the way. So there's this stumbled upon some sort of like really strong tendency in the model to create this woman. But also when I started reusing her image and combining it with other things, what we discovered was that things got really macabre and like very horror-y and, and gory. And I'm not even gonna show like the most graphic pictures, but she was sometimes, you know, surrounded by like dismembered children screaming and stuff. Um, so this kind of confirms the whole demon suspicion. Uh, <laughs> but there were really evocative images. Like this was like more striking to me emotionally than anything I had uh, created with an image uh, model before. Um, and it was like something I had discovered by accident, but also, you know, kind of leaned into and it started influencing my style. And it would like, you could transpose her as a character into like a bunch of different contexts. So you could make her a statue and then like combine that statue with other things and keep combining this, that statue with other things and then like you combine it with something else and then her red cheeks would come back suddenly or like, you know, 10 generations later eventually Loeb would disappear but you'd, you'd, you'd take one of those child images that she had disappeared from and c combine it with something else and all of a sudden Loeb would reappear. It was really strange. Um, I didn't know exactly how to describe this phenomenon to people in like a concise way that made people understand what it was. So I sat on this for like several months. Uh, it was April 2022 when I first discovered Loeb and finally in uh, September 2022, I posted this Twitter thread. I discovered this woman who I call Loeb in April. The AI reproduced her more easily than most celebrities. Her presence is persistent and she haunts every image she touches. Uh, take a seat, this is a true horror story and veers sharply macabre. And so this went viral immediately, um, like super viral. Like I was being interviewed by like every newspaper the next day and the Hollywood producers were kicking down my door um, and my life became insane um, and was forever changed. And before we get to that, I do want to say that Loeb is not necessarily like unique, that there are certain things that you can discover by using negative prompt weights in any model that you wish. And they're going to have some level of persistence that's just like in their nature, being at like the edge of the latent space. In 2021, uh, I would play with VQGAN plus clip. Uh, this is specifically the ImageNet model. Um, and there was a, a tendency I noticed for negative prompt weights to produce images that looked like they were taken inside of bushes uh, with like bird, not quite birds, not quite insects in them. So this is another trend that I have a lot of uh, pictures of, but it wasn't, it's, this is not the type of thing that goes viral. <laughs> um, and even in the 80s, um, you know, you have uh, Sirovich and Kirby's paper that has, uh, in 1987, low dimensional procedure for the characterization of human faces, where they laid out a system called eigenfaces, where basically, you know, if you, if you build a model to recognize faces, 
um, in the manifold of this model, you're going to have certain defined axes, basically, that are defined by interpolating between certain faces that emerge from this data set that don't actually exist, um, which they called eigenfaces, like eigenvectors. Um, and looking at these faces, I think most people will immediately recognize that they are demons also. <laughs> but no, they're, they, are, they have this uncanny quality because they're these emergent faces that don't actually exist. They're, they're these data ghosts, basically. And they're also very extreme, like similar to how a lobe is the farthest thing away from something else. These faces are the most extreme versions of things that you normally interpolate between to, to reach something that we consider more canny. Um, anyways, Love went viral, interviews, Wikipedia, people did fan art, they're still doing fan art. Uh, <laughs> that this thing completely changed my life last year. Um, really shone a light for me on not just the algorithms inside of AI models, but also the environment that I was putting this art into, that it went viral and suddenly I'm being recognized. Um, the algorithms increasingly govern creative work in many different ways. You know, the attention economy for artists and creative, who gets noticed, who doesn't, is now largely governed by algorithms, be it Twitter or whatever else. When you think about which jobs are valued, you know, what is AI trying to automate? It doesn't really matter if an algorithm is good at your job or not. If there's a promise that it might be in the future, shareholders start really paying attention and start like devaluing certain types of labor even before anything can really replace them, right? And so I think something really unique about generative AI is it's being sold as automating something that we have not even thought could be automated before, where most people have not really thought about this before. Creative labor, even creative ideation. You know, I think that the idea of art without someone having an idea to make art is like, I'm not going to say that's an invalid thing, but it's a very uh, interesting way to approach something, especially if you're looking to extract profit from, from content. Um, I think the Hollywood strikes that we just saw this year really also illustrate the value of different jobs or like the perceived value of different jobs because on one side of things people were arguing like, oh, like writers are going to become obsolete, which is, you know, a silly thing to say, but also it's a projection of the future and, and the, whole, the whole argument and the whole debate became like projected into an imagined future. Uh, which I thought was really interesting and problematic and strange. But to really think about, oh, we blacked out, now we're back. Um, to really think about what um, like AI art generation, how it's going to affect cultural production, I like to take two metaphors. And the first metaphor is a more optimistic one. And my computer is freaking out, or something is freaking out. The first metaphor is the drum machine. Uh, the brown drum machine there is the Lin LM1. Uh, both of these came out in 1980. The, other, the black one is the, the Roland uh, 808. But this, uh, this Lin, it came out and drummers, some drummers, kind of freaked out and were like, oh, I have to like adapt this into my workflow because these, the, the occupation of drumming is going to become so automated that I'm not going to be able to survive if I'm not effective enough at drumming without a machine. Uh, so they learned how to use this machine. But really, this machine was widely adopted because it sounded kind of weird and interesting and it changed, you know, how pop songs sound. And it has a very 80s pop sound to it. 
an even more interesting comparison is the, is, is the Roland 808 and also the 909. When these came out, they were like financial failures because no one liked how they sounded. Like they just kind of sound weird. They don't sound like real drums. They don't sound like cool fake drums. But then eventually people started taking them home and messing with them and kind of doing unintended things with them and like having them drum patterns that weren't supposed to simulate a human drumming on them and, and, and you know, distorting the sounds in different ways. And eventually, you know, the 808 forms the basis of still today's, you know, modern hip hop like sound palette. And the 909 spawned genres like, you know, acid house and drum and bass and things like this. And it defined, so enriched, it enriched our culture having these kind of weird automated things. I feel like Loeb is an example of a weird automated thing kind of emerging that has its unique feel to it that enriches something. But I don't necessarily see that as like the future of automated art making. Because what we have is we have drum machines on one side and we have cloud capital on the other. What do I mean by this? Well, I mean that much generative AI is centralized. It operates server side on cloud capital. It's governed by these big, huge companies. AI models are trained at least from scratch on massive amounts of compute. That's art of, uh, it's outside of artist's reach, at least like on an everyday thing. Now you can download Stable Diffusion or whatever and fine tune it, but it's like a totally different ball game than being able to build one from the ground up and have you know, the advances in fidelity and stuff like that that we've been seeing over the past year and a half. Once they train these tools, they wall them off and then they offer them to us through a business, uh, a service business model. And so hype and talk of you need to use this tool to stay ahead, like we heard with the drum machine, and like we're also hearing with these models today, it's also PR for expanding artists and everyone's reliance on a cloud-based infrastructure that basically is like a form of rent distraction. Um, relying on centralized services in creative work is like creatively stifling and expensive. Um, it, it sucks. Also, adversarial strategies. Uh, are actively being stomped out and like patched or neutered by AI companies with you know feedback learning and stuff like that. I think that if someone from one of these companies saw Loeb, I haven't disclosed what model it was, but um, I think if someone saw that, they would be like, oh, this is a problem, even though Loeb, I think, is a completely valid artistic expression and you should be able to make these kinds of things. You know, imagine a world in which all art is automated and then you just lose, you know, certain types of art that are deemed to be unacceptable um, would really suck. A semi-solution to this is to download, use, and train models like Stable Diffusion yourself locally. You can also run them on, cheaply run a crowd, uh, cloud compute, but you know, it's not a complete solution. And you can also develop your own methods of working against the intent of the tool. What do I mean by adversarial creative strategies? Well, I mean basically do the opposite of what they want you to do with it. These tools are created, they're molded from a desire to make a product that sells something. For example, when you put something in, if you just like type cat in mid-journey, it's gonna produce an image of a cat with like Saturn's rings behind it in like this starry sky because they want you to be like, oh my God, wow, uh, computer, amazing. It make a space cat, even though you just asked for cat. Um, this is an example of how like the style of the images that they, that these things make is so dictated upon the, the need to sell and justify it as a product. You can try to counteract the tool's statistical tendencies. Um, you can use the tool to challenge your own tendencies. That's kind of what I did with, with Loeb, is I found something and then I combined it with stuff that I was making and made my own kind of new style. You can allow the tool's tendencies to guide your work. That's also what I did. You can interrogate aspects of the training data and the labeling of the data. 
um, like a lot of these anomalies that you'll find, like the the inside of bushes pictures with the the weird bugs and birds. I mean, I think those are due to a predominant tendency to have nature photography labeled in a certain way, um, and so that you can you can dive into things like that and investigate them even more. You can also interrogate the tool's aesthetic tendencies, social biases, the ethics of the data collection, things like that. But also, when you work with these things, you're not just an artist, you're a researcher probing the data set. These data sets are so large and they're so, the models work in such an opaque way that it's like, probing the data set in this way it may not seem like an empirical study, but, there's also like less possibility of empirical study. So you are a researcher probing the data set. Art is research in this kind of interesting overlapping case. And I love to quote um, June Paik who says, I use technology in order to hit it more properly. Um, I think one of the ways in which I want to hate technology properly with generative AI is that we're like regurgitating our own data with it, like as more and more of the internet becomes this uh, slurry of automated content. It's all based on previous data that we've made and it's, it has the potential to enter into this infinite feedback loop of like, oh, we're gonna redigest this new automated slurry. Um, and I wrote this to illustrate it with the help of ChatGPT. Dear hiring manager, please give me the job. I am writing to beg for the opportunity to apply for the position of professional dog food consumer in the abandoned parking garage. I am not a good candidate for this role and do not have any unique skills or experience but I am desperate for a job and I will do anything to get it. I am so hungry for gallons and gallons of dog food and I can't wait to chow down on it every day in the secluded and private setting of the abandoned parking garage. I am not a dog lover and I do not have a keen palate for different brands and varieties of dog food, but I really want to eat it. I am also not organized, disciplined or good at meeting deadlines, but I promise I will try my best. I am a terrible candidate for this job, but please give me a chance. I am desperate for a job and I will do anything to get it, even if it means working in a creepy old parking garage and eating massive amounts of dog food. The Washington Post um, contacted me and asked for like tips and tricks uh, how to use ChatGPT to do like mundane tasks, and so I sent them this. <laughs> they, they published the first sentence of it. <laughs> <laughs> they published the first sentence of it and then linked to it and called it disturbing. Um, don't think it's exactly what they wanted. But I think it does illustrate like the desire to have a mundane and um, everyday application of this technology when really it has all of these strange quirks to it that are so interesting to make art with and not very interesting to write emails with. Um, then as mentioned in the intro, I also had a video installation at DEF CON um, and this video installation uh, I found out as I was figuring out what in the world I was going to do to exhibit at DEF CON, I found out that the AI village it was being exhibited at was a joint White House initiative. So naturally, I did a deep fake of, um, of Joe Biden talking on the big sphere that they just put there right next to the convention center that DEF CON was in, uh, where he basically talks about how he's going to deploy time-traveling shamans to, uh, <laughs> to stop the tide of, uh, of AI hype. Uh, I don't know if people got it, but... <laughs> it, 
it is online if you want to watch it later. Uh, it's called Suicide 3. Um, and yeah, I'm already done. And I guess I just want to challenge everyone to when you hear about how amazing these things are, I want you to challenge your relationship to them and, you know, be a rebel and be, do an interesting thing with them, like a really interesting thing with them and think about your relationship with them. So I challenge you to go break stuff. And uh, yeah, that's my talk. And thank you very much. Hail love. Cool, thank you, Steph. Um, if you have questions, please um, queue up at the microphones. Uh, we have roughly 10 minutes left for questions. Um, signal angel questions from the internet. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the internet asks which AI model was used for this work and uh, can those images be reproduced? Uh, the question was which AI model was used and yeah, I was, I was very careful to not disclose which model was used, unfortunately. Um, yes, they can be reproduced and yes, some people have figured out how. Uh, but no, I haven't publicly disclosed which model it was, unfortunately. Sometimes journalists will get me to disclose uh, just so they make sure that they're not like spreading a hoax. Um, but yeah, I haven't said publicly. Um, but yes, people have figured out how to do it. And then sometimes people have made completely wrong guesses. Um, but yeah. But you know, I kind of like being accused of a hoax as well. It adds mystery to it. <laughs> Thank you. Microphone number one, your question. Uh, hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, yeah, I'd like us, um, it's interesting to hear you talk about these models, uh, like, in terms of kind of like, yeah, in terms of what their capabilities are, are, are in terms of like, uh, how you can do some kind of semantic calculation with like negative prompts. And that always opens up the question for me of like, what, like, what is the, Per, what's your ideal sense of a, of, a, of a perfect image generation model that you would want to work with? It feels like it's, quite, it's very easy to pick out the flaws and we can, like, in the ethics of the data set or how they're trained, but what would, what would the ideal model look like for you, the AGI of image generation, and what do you think it would take to train that? The ideal image generation model... Um, I think that we have like gone past it already, almost, and they're disappearing. I, I love the old GANs, like VQGAN plus Clip. I think that we're striving, when they're training these models, I think that they're striving after fidelity and impressiveness in a way that takes away some of the abstract type of imagery that you can get from the GANs. Um, and, and I also feel like there's a stylistic funneling happening where like, I feel like the possibility space is shrinking in a way. Um, it's, I mean, it's really not because the possibility for higher fidelity is becoming available, but I feel like on average it's, 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 it's funneling and, and, and constricting in a way. So no, I, I don't really like the way things are going. Bring back GANs. A lot of the old collab notebooks that I used to use are like totally broken. It, it breaks my heart. Uh, and it's only, these things are only from 2021. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I, think, I think that's kind of interesting, right? Because I think a lot of people sense this, right? These tools being tightened up somehow, constrained every time they're fine-tuned in some way or, or like some additional thing is put in to kind of force them into the direction that they're being pushed commercially, you feel like you've lost something. And yet, I'm not sure there was a perfect moment, right? There was no perfect image generation tool for the AI artists of the future. So, like, where was that turning off point? and like how can we get back to it I think is my question. Oh, I don't know how we can get back to it but I think that I think we can do a better job of preserving 
like the old GANs and stuff. Um, I think that maybe we were kind of naive about how quickly the different moving parts of, of a lot of those things would start to, you know, deprecate and stuff. Thank you. Signal Angel, do you have another question from the internet? Um, yes. Uh, with a local AI model, if you would uh, train it with self-created pictures or text or something, do you think that would mimic the model creator and therefore a unique personal style? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and, and this is something that I've done on my own, on my own images. Uh, yeah, the question was if you train locally on your own images, will it mimic that style? And absolutely, yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, checking. Microphone number one, your, your question? Thank you for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, you also hinted like briefly on like the social reverbs of this, uh, yeah, post an X formerly known as Twitter. Um, <laughs> and I would be curious if you could share like uh, some more of the points that were most surprising for you on this journey. Of it going viral and the reactions from people? Yes. If you feel like. Yeah, sure. Um, the first thing that happened is I took my real name off of everything because I got some weird threats, but the threats were, I guess the threats could have been interpreted as like death threats, but also the majority of the threats I got were like spiritual. Someone said that they were going to send an army of um, spirits after me that was going to crush me into molecules, which honestly is like pretty cool, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> um, but then, but then, then, then it, as it went viral and, and people started like, actually like being critical about it, I mean, I don't just mean being positive, but like, both criticizing me and saying, you know, that they thought it was cool and they thought it was like the first emergent, you know, character in this way that had been created. Um, I put my name back on it, because that is pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, microphone number three, your question. Uh, first of all, I'd like to th thank you for my newest recurring nightmare. Um, You're welcome. Um, the question is a bit op off topic, but I'd like your opinion on, do, on interesting data sets that should be used more in AI. Do you have any opinion on that? Uh, on, on what kind of data set? Any data sets that you think are underused and interesting? Underused and interesting in AI, do you mean images or do you mean any? Dealer's choice. Underused data sets. Hmm. I feel like, I feel like the, the trend is to just use everything <laughs> for better or worse. Um, so yeah, I don't really. This, this is actually why I'm asking. Maybe there's something untapped that you would know of and I don't. Untapped data. I don't know if that's the problem in today's world. <laughs> if I'm being honest. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have anything. But it is an interesting, it is an interesting question. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mike for number two. What is your question? Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, what's your opinion on uh, AI model guardrails and alignment? AI model what and alignment? Guardrails and alignment. Oh gosh, that's a very big question. Um, and I'm not an AI developer, so it's kind of mainly in my hands as a commentator but I think that it is somewhat disappointing from an artist who, who works outside of like the traditionally accepted aesthetics, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's difficult to separate the, all this talk about alignment from 
the need for them to sell a product that doesn't do anything offensive or that could be perceived as offensive. So for example, creating lobe, creating images with gore, that's something that they would want to take out. I don't know if they would necessarily say that is alignment, but it's such a blurry line that is not entirely comfortable for me because there's so many valid forms of expression that like, if you really want to automate uh, so much of the world with these things, then that like just erases those, those, it erases horror and it erases, you know, gory imagery and stuff like that. So I guess that's my artist's take on alignment or at least the boundary between what we consider alignment and what we don't consider alignment but might fall somewhere in between. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Steph, for answering all the questions, and thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, please, everyone, a huge round of applause for Steph. <laughs>